When do you usually call out for God's help? When you're in trouble, right? Yeah. Is it, when things are going really well, do you call out, Hey, God, I just wanted to thank you for that great promotion I just got. How many of you ever done that? Oh, a couple did. I like that. We got good hands. Hey, God, I'd like to thank you for that, that wonderful thing you gave me the other day. Right? We, sometimes we do that. But do we usually think to call out to God when things are going really well in our lives? You can be honest. It's okay, because I forget too. No, we don't. We don't do that. We call out to God when we're sinking in the water, right? Peter stepped out of the boat, realized where in the world he was, and he started to sink, and he said, Jesus, save me. And what happened? Jesus saved him. He was right there. Now, we don't know how far Jesus was away from the boat when Peter said, call me to come out. But he stepped out of the boat, and his, the instant he started to sink, Jesus was within hand reach. It happened. There's something about significant challenges and trials in our lives that seem to clarify our priorities and cut through the distractions of the world and everyday life so that we can see God more clearly, so that when things are going bad, we try to look for God. But here's the twist on our passage this morning. This passage is not about us. It's all about God and what God does for us and where God is. Right? The story's not about us. This story tells us about God and it tells us two things about God. First, no matter what it is that reminds us of our need, whether it's something good or something terrible, whether we're sinking in water or are about to lose someone we love or things in our lives seem to be going chaotic and everybody in our lives is coming in on us, God is always there, and no matter what reminds us of God being there for us, God will always respond to us when we call out to Him. Just as Jesus reassures the disciples and is there to reach His hand out the moment that He starts to sink in the water, right? Also, God responds to us with compassion and support every time that we need it. But what about this little phrase in there where Jesus says to Peter, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And that word doubt, it shouldn't be doubt. It should be hesitate more than it should be doubt. Jesus isn't saying that Peter didn't have faith. Jesus is saying that he didn't believe in the faith that he had. Why did you hesitate? Oh, you of little faith. Actually, this term little faith occurs six times in the New Testament. That kind of surprised me when I figured that out this past week. As many times as we hear it or see it, it seems like it happens a whole lot more than six times in the New Testament. Five of those times it happens in the Gospel of Matthew and one time in the Gospel of Luke. And each time that this phrase is used by Jesus, it's referring to the disciples. (laughs) Specifically in our... In our passage this morning, it refers to one disciple. But every time that Jesus uses it, it refers to one or more of the disciples. Mark Allen Powell in his book, Loving Jesus, says, I noticed something else. Although Jesus calls attention to the fact that his disciples are people of little faith, he never indicates that there is anything that they can do about this. He doesn't offer to increase their faith, nor does he give them any guidance as what they might do to increase it themselves. One would think that if little faith is what's holding these disciples back, then Jesus would tell them what to do about this problem. But he doesn't. He points out their little faith as an explanation for why they are not making the progress as quickly as they would like. But he never tells them they can get more faith to remedy the situation. Each of the six times Jesus says that they have little faith, he never offers to increase it. He never offers them any advice on how they can do it. And he never says that what they have in faith is bad. He just says that it's little. And when we see something that's little, we automatically think that that is bad. Right? Little people can't do anything, which is a lie. Some of these children can increase your faith if you just listen to them. Because parents told me this past week, you know, we sat up here in the mornings doing those skits and it looked like it was chaos and none of them were paying attention but then they went home later that afternoon and told their parents or their grandparents everything that happened in a skit up here 
when they looked like they weren't paying attention at all. They get it. They understand it. And we can't dismiss them just because they're little. Because their faith is something that will definitely increase our faith if we let them. See, Jesus says that they have little faith, but that faith is enough. Just like your faith is enough. No matter how much you have, no matter how much you think you don't have, whatever it is that God is giving you in the faith category is absolutely enough to get you through and see you through everything that's going to happen in your life. But Jesus sends these people out into the sea, right? He tells them to go across the sea. In the storms of life, and our little faith sometimes seem to be the things that keep us from seeing who God is and following through on the mission that God has sent us to. So can the storms at sea and the little faith that we have keep us from reaching the destinations that Jesus is sending us to go to? Can the storms in life that rage around us be something that keeps us from what God has set in front of us as something that we need to complete? You see, Jesus sent the disciples out onto the sea knowing that the storm was coming, knowing what was going to happen to them. But he sent them out anyhow. Why was it important for the disciples to cross the sea? Sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. Why did the disciples cross the sea? Because they needed to get to the other side, right? Right. What's on the other side? No, Jesus was back on this side still. Good answer. You would think that would be the right answer. Jesus isn't there yet. Actually, Jesus is already there. There's no place we can't go that Jesus isn't already there. Right? We're not going anywhere to take Jesus with us. We're going someplace to encounter Jesus and to help others encounter Jesus. But he sends the disciples across the sea. What's across the sea? More people. More people. What kind of people? Unknowing people. Unknowing people. They are, in our story this morning, they are specifically Gentiles. Right? Where their Gennesaret is actually where they wind up in Mark. And the next part of the passage in Matthew, in chapter 14, talks about Gennesaret. Gennesaret is where the, the pigs go off the ledge because Jesus sends the demons into the pigs. Um, but the people on the other side are people that aren't like us. Right? They're different. They're the people that are out there. They're the unchurched. Or they could possibly be unchurched. They could be minorities. They could be single adults. They could be married adults. They could be couples without children. They could be homosexuals. They could be physically, mentally challenged people. They could be people whose first language is not English. They could be loud and noisy children that run around all the time. They could be hard of hearing elderly people that sit in the pew and can't hear what you're saying. They could be any number of people because they're different than we are. Right? They're different. And therefore... They're outsiders. They're people who are not quite like us. They are people whom we might consider unclean. Right? In the story this morning, when Jesus sends the disciples across the Sea of Galilee, they're going to the unclean Gentiles. They're going to those other people that we're not supposed to mix with. They are people for whom Jesus compels the disciples to go across the sea and each and every day sends us out into the world to talk to and be a part of, and listen to, and tell them how much God loves us and them. They are the people for whom our going to will likely cause a storm in most congregations. Be that personally, because someone thinks that they're not accepted to come to worship. Or in a congregation who thinks that, what are we going to do if these people actually come into our midst? I met with several congregations as I looked for this new call and there was a hint in some of them of we want to change but we don't want to change if it's actually going to change us. We want new people to come in but we want them to be exactly like us. And does that work? I'll be the first to tell you that's not going to work <laughs> because the people out there are not like us. Right? That doesn't make them bad and that doesn't make us good. They're just different. And we have something that everybody absolutely needs. And what is that? Jesus. We have the treasure that we sought for at Sun Treasure Island. 
that treasure of God's love. The people that are out there are not bad. They're just different. And different is not bad. You see, we may, we also need to remember that what we're sitting in right now is called what? It's a sanctuary. But what's another word for this area out here? What? No, congregation. I'm looking for an old traditional term. Starts with an N. Oh, this is good. None of you know this. Maybe I don't want to tell you. This is actually called the nave of the church. Right? It doesn't look like a traditional nave of a traditional standing congregational building. But this is the nave. And where does the word nave come from? It comes from the Latin word navis, which means... Does anybody know? What did the disciples go across the sea in? A boat. Navis is the Latin word for boat or ship. Right? That's why when you go to a traditional church, the top of the building is kind of rounded and bowed. It's an upside-down boat is where we get the design for most names of a, of a congregation. And the ship that we are in is not intended to remain tied to the shore. It's meant to be untied and to go across the sea. It's meant to be untied and to go out to people that need to hear about the message. We can't sit in here and be safe and stay tied to the shore. We have to go out the doors into the world and tell everybody about what God has given to us and is therefore willing to give to them. I said there was two things that this passage told us about. I've only told you one yet. Have you been keeping track of that? This is the second one now. The second part of what what this passage tells us about God is that God not only responds to our need, but He actually desires that we seek to live lives of abundance and courage. He doesn't want us to stay in the boat tied up to the dock. He wants us to step out of the boat and walk on the water. Right? Notice that Jesus actually commanded the disciples to cross the sea. It was an actual command that Jesus said. He said, get in the boat and go. He knew the storm was coming. He knew what they were going to face, but He sent them out anyhow. You know what? God knows exactly what you're going to face when you go out those doors and try to talk to people about Him and His love for you. It's not going to be pretty, but He's still telling you to go. Get in the boat and go. Or get out of the boat and go. All right? Jesus sends them, trusting them to navigate both the sea and the storm. And while some may suggest that Peter's request to join Jesus upon the waves is, a, is an impetuous foolishness, I bet Jesus smiled when Peter said, If it's you, call me to come to you. Can you see it? Jesus standing on the water and Peter saying, If it's you, call me out there. He was elated with excitement and the fact that somebody actually got it and had faith enough in him that they would be able to do something they knew was was impossible. He delighted in the fact that Jesus, that Peter called and wanted to come to him. And Jesus' response to the disciples here is threefold. The threefold response to his disciples is he urges them to take heart and he reveals his presence to them with, in, and among them and for them. Jesus says, take heart, it is I. It's another bad translation. Take heart, ego, a me. Which is always funny because my wife always says, let go my ego when I talk about that. (laughs) But Jesus said, take heart, Ego a me, and ego a me is I am. And what is I am? Who else said I am to somebody else at a bush that was burning? I am is known in the biblical understanding, in the Jewish sector, in the, in the Hebrew Old Testament, and in the New Testament. When someone says I am, that is claiming the name of God. Jesus said, take heart, I am. Everybody, the disciples and all of Matthew's listeners would have known that when Jesus said that, he was claiming to be God. That he was saying that he was God. No one would, would mistake the pronouncement of the divine name. He says, take heart. I am. And then he encourages the disciples once more to leave fear behind and live into the life that he has called them to you. Take heart. I am. Do not be afraid. The exact same thing he says to us. I know the storms you're going to face when you go out of this building, but take heart, because I am God, and I'm always going to be with you. 
and you don't have to fear anything that's going to happen to you because God is calling us and God's desire for us is that we trust what God is doing with us, for us, and through us and thereby live lives with courage and hope, taking chances, risking ourselves in relationships and seeking the welfare of individuals in the community around us, all the while remembering that even when we overlook God's presence, God is always there. Even when we don't know that He is, He's always there. Sometimes to encourage us to overcome our fears, sometimes sending us out ahead of Him, and sometimes reaching out to grab hold of us in forgiveness, mercy, comfort, and grace. So untie the boat from the dock and go knowing that the storms are still going to be out there, but that God is always with us. And He's sending us out to take His love to everybody because everybody needs to hear about it.